years ago, I was sent to Madagascar to reorganize the Swiss development aid in the country. I still remember a conversation I had with a Malagasy peasant dressed in rags about the notion of wealth. She admitted she was struggling to make ends meet and that she was working very hard to improve access to food, health and education for her family. But she also stated very calmly, but adamantly, that thanks to the varied tradition and culture of her own society, that she would never consider herself as being poor. And as she spoke, what it struck me was that I could perceive no fear in her eyes. Now, in 30 years of globetrotting, I've learned that systems are reluctant to change unless they are strained by crisis. Crises are usually accompanied by increased levels of fear. And decisions made under the influence of fear tend to intensify problems because they are made on perceptions rather than facts. And I also learned that in matters related to sustainable access to wealth, acting at micro level is important but insufficient. For example, 2008, a global food crisis led to riots in Cairo and other cities around the world as social and political unrest hit both developed and poor nations. These events should have taught us that global crises cannot be dealt with only at local level. In fact, short-term decisions made by national authorities to, con to try and control a massive and rapid increase of food prices only read in an even more acute problem. Because our model of consumption and production is based on cheap transport of food and no food scarcity. And both assumptions prove to be incorrect. And if you consider today's international relationships with the increasing number of conflicts and displaced populations, it's, it's really impossible to argue that we are currently live in a world where wealth is generalized. Media outlets hammer us daily with negativity, making citizens afraid of a world they feel is going to threaten the quality of life. Migration, the effects of climate changes, the surge of violent extremism, and even the simple fear of losing jobs are all pushing in the direction of creating new barriers. So, if you follow this logic, one would have expected that multilateral, key multilateral negotiations had and international conferences in 2015 were bound to terribly fail. And yet, the Hill concluded with historical success, like in, in New York and Paris, where countries agreed that climate change has to be addressed and that sustainable development is not just about economic growth and reducing extreme poverty, but also about fighting, increasing inequalities everywhere. All nations, represented by the very same authorities that today are restricting fundamental rights in the name of national securities, they also clearly admitted that there is a need to collectively nurture the planet if you want to assure that, that we have prosperity for the generations to come. So, how could this magic happen from setting barriers to collectively nurturing a planet? How did how, how this come? When I facilitated some of these complex negotiations at the United Nations in New York, I found that the most effective way to lift up the quality of the negotiations was to focus on state-of-the-art information and knowledge sharing. And historically, you have to almost always to go through a dramatic climax to overcome the barrier 
set by politically driven and very often prudent national positioning. In order to manage this, as a facilitator, I gently prepare negotiators by setting up a dialogue based on facts. I then push them slowly out of their comfort zones by creating a kind of no man's land where the negotiators start to think and engage beyond the limits imposed by their own instructions. In other words, I build up a pressure to create a potential energy aiming at overcoming fears and mistrust and allowing negotiators to feel in being part of a common effort. Now, this potential energy can be applied in any situation because when you are not fearful anymore, you are prone to embark on new adventures. But key is to find ways to strengthen access to the knowledge coming out from our experiences, innovations, and technological advances. Let me illustrate this very simple com concept with, a, with an example, very concrete example. A few years ago, I chaired a group of donors supporting Tanzania in reforming its own health care system. After 10 years of this implemented reform, child mortality was reduced by one third and mother's mortality by 55%. And this was an amazing accomplishment if you consider that in Tanzania, expenditure for health are hundreds, if not thousands of times lower of any developed country. So wh what we did, actually, instead of continuing our bilateral support to Tanzania health sector, we set up a common support mechanism that facilitated us to share more, better share our knowledge and our experience, allowing also us to be more precise in the use of our capacities to adapt them to the local needs. In this way, we managed to overcome an initial sense of mistrust that allowed us to generalize the application of these innovations. Now, in your daily life, you might have come across a problem and someone would come up with a solution whom you would not necessarily trust. In the past, what we would do, we would contact a third party. Today, we tend to go to the internet to try and try to shape our decisions. And here lies one of our biggest challenges. We have to find ways to get a more focus, to find ways to get this information from the massive interconnectivity that we're, that we're witnessing today and the potential of tec the communication technology. This suggests also that we should consider reorganizing research in a way that everyone can have access to the results in an ordered manner. Let me explain this with an example, another concrete example, that relates to what we call water diplomacy. Last year in New York, for the first time ever in history, countries agreed that water is an issue that has to be dealt with beyond the national borders. Immediately after, a panel of experts was set up in Geneva to find ways to find solutions that could be applied where water is a source of tensions, of conflicts, of conflict among countries. And you know there are several cases out there. Now, moving forward, it's important to learn from the very few positive experiences out there, like in the case of the Senegal River, where a commission manages both the use of the water and the sharing of the financial returns among Mauritania, Mali, Guinea, and Senegal. 
It looks simple, but it is not. Because countries don't have or don't want to share accurate data on issues that are considered of strategic importance, like water. And now our team focus here is to try to convince all parties that everyone will benefit by sharing information and technologies related to water management. And actually, I just came two, three days ago from Senegal, where, we, where this panel met to exactly visit what's going on there. And it was, frankly speaking, it was refreshing to see exchanges that never occurred before between African teams, between Central Asian teams, South American and European ones. My last point is referred to many, if not all of you. All these nice ideas about how to improve access to wealth cannot be successful if they remain confined into the public sector. We must expand it beyond the realm of the public sphere. And, of course, philanthropic attitude and citizen solidarity are important, are key, but we need more. Time has come that the private sector moves, or should move, from a kind of corporate social responsibility to an integration of all elements of sustainability, economical, social, environmental, into the main business plan. And I'm making, currently, with my team, a big effort. And what we want to achieve within the public sector is to create the incentives that allow jointly to move in this direction. And we have to do it now. There is not much time to wait. I currently manage a team of 120 passionate, dedicated young development practitioners at the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation. We are dealing with matters from, from climate change, water, food security, health and migration. We look at things from a global perspective, but we are very much rooted into practical experiences in order to create the knowledge that must be shared if we want to move forward. And, of course, I have to deal with administrative tasks and bureaucracies as well, which is not necessarily where I'm very strong. But, but I do it. But the main mandate I gave to myself is to make sure that everyone on my team, like you so within the Malagasy, high, Malagasy day Lady Highs, has no fear in developing a positive attitude to a change in all of the projects. And I thank you.